Welcome to the Transforming Assessment webinar series. Uh, this is the session for 3 September. Um, today's presenter is Richard Lobb from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Um, I'm going to be heading off there in, in, the, in November. So Richard is going to be speaking about his a Code Runner um, online module or question type, which is a Moodle question type. And that will be looking at the authentic e-assessment of computer programming. So Richard, if you would like to take over, please. Thank you. Welcome aboard, everybody. Oops, I'm out of focus. Well, oh, probably here we go. Focus now. So, just before I get going, one point of clarification here. You'll see it says I'm from the Department of Computer Science and Software Engineering. I should just point out that I'm a nominally retired old fart, as you can see. And I retired about 11 years ago, early retirement, from the University of Auckland, thinking I was going to go and get a life. But it never quite happened. And so I finished up down here, filling in, teaching, programming at various levels. And I've been sort of temporary part-time now for some 11 years. So it's not very temporary, and it's certainly not very part-time. But the key thing here is that this is just about teaching. I'm not a researcher. I'm not paid to research anymore. So I just focused totally on teaching programming in the best way I could figure out. So moving on then, just to point out for those of you who are programmers, it's pretty obvious. If you're not, it mightn't be obvious. Programming is a skill. It's, it's a skill in the same way that, for example, I'm going to turn off that video so I don't have to look at myself. It's a skill in the same way that writing an exercise or playing the piano, or speaking a foreign language is. But it has one or two important differences. And first of all, it's extremely exacting. By that I mean that if you have, say, 100 pages of code and there's one semicolon in the wrong place, then your code doesn't work, simple as that. And there's not many other disciplines as fussy as that. And the other thing is a very large 10 to 1 performance ratio. By that I mean that in any group of programmers, there will normally be something like a 10 to 1 difference over the group in the performance output per unit time. This means in the case of teaching that if you set an assignment that will take one hour for a good student, top student A plus, it will probably take something like 10 hours for the C minus student and infinity hours for the D and E students. So those two properties make teaching programming somewhat unusual. Like all skills, it's taught by doing it. And here's a, a computer lab. That's one way of doing it. And nowadays, increasingly, students are doing their computing at home, sitting there on the home computers, talking to other people through chat rooms, Facebook, everything else. So in that context, the question that I want to deal with is how do you motivate, reward, assess the students? And as usual, assessment breaks into two sorts. The sort of formative assessment, which is really motivational, pedagogical, and that is what we have to apply in labs and assignments, trying to get students to do the work, feel motivated, enjoy the work. And we also have the, in the final exams, we have the summative assessment. We have to come up with a grade for them at the end of the year. Coming back to labs then, we could record attendance, which is what we used to do, but as I say, that's increasingly irrelevant. And while it's cheap, it's not at all motivational. It's the, the most it could be regarded as a, a penalty-based system if you didn't attend. Um, and at the other end of the scale, we have the idea that you inspect all the student's work and you sign off on it. And this is hugely expensive, particularly in computing, when you not only have to look at what they've done, you actually have to test it because it might have that dreaded missing semicolon and not actually do anything. So that's the formative assessment. And I'm just going to briefly talk about the final assessment. Traditionally, of course, in examinations, we use handwritten exams. And here's one. Here's the final page of one of our introductory programming papers. You won't be able to read the details. But it has a piece of code up here at the top. If I got a pointer, I might as well get a pointer. Um, one minute, just finding my way here. Or maybe you see this. A pointer here, we have. Um, a class, a bit of code that defines a class, and we ask the students to write some sort of um, subclass from that. And we give them a box in which to write it. So that then the question is, what happens? Well, this is one of the things that happens. How many marks do we give this? Let me see now. Well, the students started off down here, and they seemed to go OK, crossed out something, and 
The trouble with programming, of course, is that you keep remembering all the stuff you've forgotten, all the decorations. So you can see the students been inserting lines in here and then another bit up here and coming back down here and winding around and crossing stuff out. And uh, how many marks do I give it? And hopefully, if you know any programming, you'll appreciate that this is a near impossible task. And you're meant to feel all sorry for me having to mark it. That's certainly what I thought at the time I was photocopying it. But there's actually a more important aspect here, and that is you should be feeling even more sorry for the student who had to write that. Because programming is not a pencil and paper activity at all. It's an interactive process between a human and a computer, and the computer is constantly reminding you of layout, syntax errors, it's got syntax coloring, you're able to test little bits of code as you go, and all of that goes away in the exam room if you're sub subjecting the poor student to this sort of exam. So what do we do? Just to recap then, the problem I want to deal with is how do we authentically assess programming ability? And I want to focus on those three separate areas, the labs, the assignments, and the exams. I'm going to more or less lump labs and assignments together. They're closely related. So the answer, of course, drum roll, is my little baby, the plugin called CodeRunner. Now, just uh, what is CodeRunner? Well, it's a Moodle question type. And I'm assuming most of you know about Moodle. I'm quite sure that Tim Hunt knows about Moodle. Hi, Tim. Uh, and it was inspired by a brilliant website by a Stanford lecturer in programming called Nick Pavanti, and he's, wrote, he's got this website, codingbat.com, which uh, I did use for some years, an excellent website, but it's not part of your main teaching infrastructure, and it's somewhat limited in the sort of questions you can deal with. So CodeRunner, then, is a plugin type that essentially grades program code. It grades it in a in an adaptive mode. That is, the students post the code in, they click check, and they're told immediately whether it passes their tests or not. And if it doesn't, they get to fix it at a penalty at a price. So I'm going to try to demonstrate this by taking you into our quiz server and show you, a, show you what it looks like. So here we are on the Computer Science and Software Engineering quiz server. As you can see, art is an artistic layout, some web pages are not really my thing. We're going to go into this page here, Code Runner Demo. And I'm going uh, to. Richard, do you want to do the screen sharing at this point? Because we're just still stuck on the first slide at the moment. <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you. I forgot to click the vital button, didn't I? Available screen sharing. Share desktop. And Google Chrome. Thank you, Matthew. Share. Right. Does that work now, Matthew? You're looking good? Yep, we see order and paging code runner demo written on the page. Great. I, I hope everybody can see that. I hope so too. Somebody will squeak, presumably, if you can't. I can't see the. Actually, let me shrink the page a bit so I can still see the chat room. Right, here we go. Can see. Good. Thanks for, for the feedback, folks. Okay, so I'm going to preview a, uh, a quiz. I was going to preview a quiz, if I can come down here, preview. So this is what the quiz looks like to a student. They get questions like this. This is about as trivial a question as I could possibly ask. It says, write a Python 3 function square of n that returns the square of its numeric version of the n. This would be um, lesson number one, question number one probably. And so the student has to put their answer into here. Now, it's important to point out that this is meant to be running in an ordinary lab environment. This is a lab type quiz. And so the student has access to all their normal development tools. And so they should develop their code, first of all, and paste it in there. So I'm going to pretend I'm doing that. Here's my code editor, which I'll try to drag. Is everybody seeing that too? Uh, no, you don't see it because you've only shared the window for the piece of ah. software. So. Oh, well, never mind. You don't need to see that. Really. Yeah. Imagine Imagine you're looking at a, a screen with an editor on it. I don't need two windows. So I'm going to copy the code out of my uh, development environment, and I'm going to paste it into here. And if I was a uh, halfway intelligent student, I would have tested my code first. Well, let's, here we go. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously not a very intelligent student, because this is not quite the right answer. But that doesn't mean to say all students always get it right. So I first of all click that check button. 
remember we're running in an adaptive mode and what we get then is I'll just drag that down so you can see it is something like that so it's a horrible red color it's got little crosses all over it except for one tick and important to notice at the bottom it says your code must pass all tests to earn any marks this is a really important point in programming it's no good handing in a program that sometimes works it has to work on all the cases at least all the cases that I've managed to test them on so the student at this stage says oh, silly me I've returned two times n instead of n times n or n squared so they fix their program and they check again and now it all goes nice and green and they get a little tick saying past all tests and they're told that it counting for previous tries this gives 0.9 out of 1 so they got 90% because they lost 10% through being rather foolish and not checking their code before they ran it so and what else do I need to tell you about on this slide one minute while well, I think can't see anything much there oh yes I did want to mention one important thing and that is how incredibly rewarding the green color is and I don't have any explanation for this it's extraordinary to me but even I get a little bit of a buzz when all the green ticks come up pat myself on the back with a clever boy am I I can write a one line program uh, I shouldn't feel good about it it should be trivial but I do and I see students in the lab just getting a real buzz out of their code going green it's an instant feedback very rewarding so I'm going to go back to my slides if I can figure out how and hopefully my slides are back up again are they that's looking good yeah I pressed the slide button so hopefully you should get now I've got access too I discovered what I need to do to do that so let me just temporarily get rid of that hmm. is that right there Matthew have you got it yeah I can see the slides so if you want to press the forward button to see if you can can you see it on your side yeah okay there we go You're looking good. Yep. okay yep. So just to recap then, um, first of all the students get the red crosses, they hate them, they get quite upset about them, a typical lab quiz there will be 10 questions, the whole quiz is worth 1%, the questions individually are worth 0.1% of, of their course grade and the penalties are typically a tenth, so they're looking at 100th of 1% and they get awfully upset about it, sometimes even, oh, oh can I have that note back, it's extraordinary to me, when it goes green they're happy, that's good. Happy students are good. Now, a little bit about how it all works. I'll try not to get too bogged down here. So a question in a code runner, um, well, a code runner question looks like a, a template. I'll explain that in a minute. And some tests, test cases. Each test case has a piece of code that's used to test one aspect of the program. It has some input that's going to be put into the program when the test is run and it has the expected output that should come out. The program that's being run then is built by taking the student answer, that's this thing here, and combining it using the template from the actual code runner question through a program here called the Tweed Template Engine. That gives the executable program. The executable program goes into a sandbox, which is just a protected environment for running the code, gives some output, the output is then compared in a, in a grader in some sort of sense, usually for exact match, but it can also be regular expression match or approximate matches. And then it goes through the renderer and back out into the results table. If the student doesn't like it, they iterate around that loop. That's the architecture. And the key thing to note then is this idea of a question template, which is where a lot of flexibility comes from. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the sandbox as a detail unless anybody asks me. So what sort of questions can you ask? Well, you've seen a very trivial one. That was a, a simple write Python function. But you can ask almost unlimited sorts of questions. But the built-in ones are in the following languages, C, C++, Python 2, Python 3, Java, MATLAB, Octa, JavaScript, and PHP. That's not uh, much of a limitation. Those happen to be the languages I've taught in the last few years, which is why I've plugged them all and then in those languages you can ask questions like write a whole program, write a, a function or a method, or in the case of Java, write a class. And then there are the custom types that I will briefly talk about. So now I'm going to go back and try, let's see any questions there, I'm going to try to demonstrate the authoring interface so you can see 
what it looks like. Yeah, I have a few problem here. I have hosting is paused. Does that come up now? How are we doing? Can you guys see that? Uh, what we're seeing is the quiz that you were showing us last time yep. on your on your um, that's yeah, fine. That's what I'm on your Chrome doing. browser. Yep. yep, that'll be fine. Okay, so I'm now going to turn into a uh, question author, and I'm going to go into the editing interface, and I'm going to create a new question. Uh, we're not seeing any movement though. Nothing seems to be happening. So maybe we want to stop the sharing and to get it to restart again. Okay, let's try. Thanks for that. Um, I will try to do that. Stop that. Shut that down. No, while we come back here, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to start it again. It says select start sharing to start application sharing or switch modes, which I'm trying to do. Start sharing. Here we go. All good. Share. Right, now we're back again. That's the one we wanted. Hopefully you can see that. How's that looking? Yeah, we can see order in paging code runner demo that yep, your CSE quiz server homepage. Yep, that's good. Right. Okay, so I'm now going to try to be a question author. Here goes again. So I'm going to edit a quiz and I'm going to create a new question. As usual in Moodle, I get a list of the questions that I can set, and here's the new code on the type, so I'm going to pick that one, and then I'm going to fill in the details. So there's a subtype within Code Runner, and this specifies the particular language and the essentially the template that I'm going to use to construct the question. So I can have a C for main details of it. You have a C functions, a C program, with a Closure question in there, one of the lectures wanted about Java class, Java method, and so on. I'm going to go with Python 3. I'm going to set a very simple question, so I don't need such a big answer box. I'm going to just go reduce the size of the answer box. And in here, I would set the penalties that I wish to apply for this particular question. This is a bit more flexible than the normal Moodle question penalty regime. I'm going to go for 10, 20, dot, 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 which will apply a successive penalty of 10% to each successive wrong submission. A common alternative is this one, where the student gets one free submission. Sometimes we even give them free, two free submissions before we start penalizing them. Depends on the question type. Also, it depends on whether we're in an exam situation or we're in a, a lab test. So in a lab test, I normally go with 10% penalty in a in an, in, in an exam, I will often go with a naught, just so that they don't get upset by one free, one little error, so the error they make. So there's the penalty regime, 10, 20. I'm going to give this one a name. It's going to be a trivial variant on the square function. And I'm going to say something like, write a function cube of n that returns, oops, can't quite come like that, returns a cube of its parameter n. Probably should I tell size that, won't bother right now. Scroll down here and I have to set some test cases. These can take various forms. I can type multi lines of code if I like. Let's say, for example, I decide to say um, in cubed equals the cube of minus 3, and then I go print in cubed. That would be one sort of test I could write, and the expected output from that would be minus 27. Or I can set a another simpler, I can do that on one line. Of course, I can go print the cube of 2, and I would expect to print 8. You'll see that I can provide input that should be applied. There isn't any in this case, it's just a function. And I can control the visibility of the different test cases. Usually, I would have one hidden test case to stop them synthesizing a piece of code out of the that satisfied just the tests they got to see. Did I type 29? Ooh, that's an interesting bit of arithmetic. Let's try 27. And there's another important box here, and that's user's example. So if I save that now, that's a sort of working question, a very simple 
question to check if they can write a tube function. And then the last thing I should do is preview it. So I'm not sure. Oh, you probably can't see my preview, can you? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, that no, we're okay. We can see the preview window. You can see probably. The preview. Yeah. Yep, no, we're good. Sub window or something. Okay, that's good. So I'll check and see if it works. I'll go def cube of n um, return n to the power of three. I check that. Quite often I make mistakes when I'm composing. In this case, I didn't. So that one's passed all the tests. And you'll notice that the there's a little box up here which says, for example, test result. Anyone that's got the user's example checkbox checked will appear in this little table so that students can check their code on at least some of the test cases. And also it helps them understand the specification. So that's the basic authoring interface. There's just one more thing I'll show before I leave that. And that is that there's a lot more to it than that. And let me say, for example, I'm going to actually say I'll, I'll create another question. I'm going to create a new question this time of, for example, a C function. So C function. So the C function behaves more or less like the Python bit of code, but sometimes I want to have a customized version. If I click customize, I get a whole heap more information. So what I now see is the actual template that was used to construct the program. And for those who can read C, it consists of some you know, includes at the front, the student answer, the declaration of the function goes in there, an outer uh, main function, and the particular test gets inserted in here. There's also, uh, I can hide various columns, I should have explained in the, in the results table, and I can specify whether I want to grade it with a an exact match, a nearly exact match, regular expressions, and so on. I can also, if I'm really desperate, switch on advanced customization. And I'll talk about this in the slides rather than going through it in detail. It's very complex. But I can set things like the CPU time limits, how much memory they've got, what particular sandbox I want to use to test it with, what the language is. And I can also do something uh, which I'll talk about later. I can save it as a new prototype. That is, I can generate my own question types on the fly. So I'll switch back now to the blackboard, um, if I can figure out how, one minute. Uh, do you want to go back to the slides now? I'm trying to, but I've lost my... Okay, I'll, that's right. I'll stop it, and then I will switch it back to the slides. Okay. Ah, thank you, Matthew. Right. So just to recap some of that, just very quickly, these are those sort of built-in slides. You select the code runner question as the top level. Then you select the subtype, the code runner, essentially the template that's used to build the program. Then you apply what penalty grading you want, penalty regime. Normally we run with all or nothing grading, although you can run on per test case grades if you like. Type in the spec for the question. Type in some test cases and pick which ones you want to use as examples. Then you preview it and hopefully it all goes and you've got a live quiz. Right. <laughs> What's this? Andrew, something I'm familiar with. Say the correct thing and write the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, that was the number 27, was it right? Um, okay. So the next thing I wanted to demonstrate, and I should have, shouldn't have gone away from that. Um, I'm not sure I need to demonstrate this. I think the slide will do this. We ran with that sort of question as a supplement to the laboratories for a couple of years. So we would hand out printed specifications to the students and uh, then we would have a quiz that ran alongside the uh, lab spec and they would be told at certain points in the lab description to go and do quiz question number three. And the quiz at, at that point was perceived as being the proof that they'd done the lab. It wasn't considered to be the lab. But what's happened in recent years is we've got to the stage now in which we can enter all of the uh, lab specification into the quiz as well using the information type pseudo question. So we have info questions, they're not questions at all, in which we 
give them a book or it, and then we interleave that with the different sorts of questions. Not always code runner, they may be multi choice, closed questions, fill in the blanks, whatever. It's um, due to the wonders of the middle um, question system, thanks Tim. It's extremely flexible as to how you can construct essentially a lesson. Of course, Moodle does have lessons, but they don't have a flexible question type, so we just use quizzes for the same purpose. And this has had some surprising spin offs that I wasn't expecting. One of the biggest is that it's now much more maintainable and updatable. And if you're sitting in a lab, for example, and you see a student doing something wrong, you ask them why they're doing it, you realize you've explained something poorly, you simply write there and then fix up the question wording. Whereas in the past, we would probably have just lived with it, or we'd have had to go back to our office and edit the original source and make a PDF of it and upload a PDF to Moodle and then send a note out to all the students telling them that there's a new version to download, etc. This is instant update. Students all get it right there in the lab immediately. So that was a huge win by being able to turn our actual computing laboratories into quizzes. Now I mentioned the customization of questions. And I've shown you that when you click customize, you get a lot more options, such as the ability to set the runtime parameters for the program. And most importantly, the ability to set the template. And I'll show you why that's useful in a minute. And also, you can explain or choose different ways of grading. Mostly, I don't bother. I'm, my attitude is that the students are meant to be learning programming. They've got to learn to get it exactly right. I'm not interested in answers that have some of the right properties. So I don't bother with anything except exact. But I did add this one in the request of uh, another colleague. And regular expressions are occasionally useful. So I said the template was useful. I've explained this template here. That's the very one I used as an example. And that's the template for a C function. If you wanted instead for the test column to simply contain an expression, I could edit the template so that it actually said printf open parenthesis, test not test code, whatever. Um, possibly with, um, depending on whether it's expected to, to be numeric, the appropriate percentage D, percentage F, or percentage S format. So you can essentially make it work the way you want it to, but we've chosen the, the explicit print statement. And as I've also explained, there's advanced customization capabilities as well that let you define your own question types or edit the so-called um, advanced combinator, the advanced template, the combinator template. I won't talk much about this. It's an efficiency thing. It lets you set up a program that runs all of the tests in one and then carves them up into individual test cases again. And here's an example that is somewhat of a variant on a simple um, writer function type program. This particular one asks the student to insert a piece of code which will make the rest of make the program as a whole print out P is equal to the point 1020. And in order to make that work, they have to declare a type. You don't tell them that. You don't tell them they're writing a function or anything like that. You just let them work out what it is they've got to write. So they must realize that they need a type declaration and that it's going to have to have fields X and Y, and so they write a type to F. And that gets inserted directly into the template code. Um, as you can see up here, but the actual test, there's no test, it's all built into the template. So this gives you the ability to give the students uh, an existing piece of code, remove a little bit of it, and get them to write the missing bit, which is often quite useful rather than writing whole functions. It allows you to constrain the type of answer the student can produce. For example, it has to be recursive rather than iterative, or it has to use some predefined class that you've given them. So much for correctness. Uh, as I'm sure any programmer knows, there's more to programming than just getting a program that is correct. It has to be maintainable. It has to be readable by humans. How do we do that? And I guess the answer is with difficulty. We can't really assess quality or style without a human. So we do have some element of style grading by humans, but a lot of it we can get by without humans by using style checking software. And the particular 
style checking program we use is one called Pilot. So I'm going to, uh, I think, briefly demonstrate this if we can get this application sharing system running again. Let me try and demonstrate that capability. So this is not a built-in question type of code runner. Is that up and running, Matthew? Yep, we can see some movement on your web browser. Right. So let me go back to preview. And I'll go to a different question. Zoom out a bit so I can navigate better. I don't know where it is. Let's try looking here. I'm sorry, I can't find it. One minute. There it is. So there's two functions there, there's two questions there that nominally look equal. They both have the same description. Write a program that uses the input function to do something, and it tests their correctness. So again, you'll have to imagine you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to paste in a piece of code I've written in my IDE, and I'm going to paste that into the answer, and I'm going to test it, and hopefully it's going to work. And so that's all right, but it's not a very nice piece of code. It's got a NEM equals input, whatever does that mean. There's no documentation, there's no functions. And so it wouldn't really pass our style rules. So here's the same question again, but this one has the extra line in, uh, statement in it. The program must be pilot compliant. So if I now paste that bit of code in and the student tries to get it marked, they get told a dreaded orange red colored box and we will be able to see this. It says essentially Pilot doesn't approve of your program. It's missing a module doc string and it's got an invalid constant in the end. I'm not sure if this is still on your screen, but unless somebody squeaks, I'm going to keep going. So what I then have to do is rewrite it according to the style guidelines in the course, which are enforced by this program Pilot. And there's the improved version. It uses a better name. It has a function. It has a doc string at the top to say what the program does. It has a doc string to say what the function does. And now when I check that, it goes green again. Oops, it was going to go green. What did I do? You found indentation. Oh, dear. Uh -huh. well, that was interesting. In the process of pasting it through from my editor, I seem to have had some issues. Found indentation. One, two, three, four. I'm not completely sure what's going on here. And I'm going, if this doesn't work, I'm going to give up. Let's check that. Seems to be objecting to. Uh, well, we have a small hiccup, which I'm not sure I think is worth trying to investigate. Let me just see if I can immediately see what it is. Give me one minute, folks. Um, undefined variable enum. That's from the previous. Um, oh, I'm printing the name. Sorry, I had a bad code. Oh, let's try that. Right. Phew. Okay. So I had pasted you know, a very naughty student. I hadn't tested my code first, had I? So now that works and it goes green. So this enforces some degree of style. So let me go back to my Blackboard Collaborate. If you can plug me into the slides again, please. I'll just stop this. Here we go. So that takes us quite a lot of the way. A lot of the sort of annoying things that you waste time checking can be done by a program. And there's the same demo. I won't go through it again. Right. Advanced code runner. The questions so far are all quite simple, as you can see, so I don't want you to get the feeling that all you can do with these questions is ask trivial exercises. You can have essentially arbitrarily complex programs. They can paste in pages of code, and you can test the pages of code with different tests. Sometimes you can give them marks for getting some of the tests right because they've got some of the functionality present and they're lacking other bits. We've had one student, one, one lecturer, sorry, has set a, an exercise for the students to submit an entire compiler. That's a very simple compiler, a simple language. But the template code for grading that had to 
run the student's compiler with a test program where they've had to compile and the output of that was then run on the Java virtual machine and the output of that was then compared with the expected output. And the same lecturer has set up question types that allow him to assess the ability of students to do theoretical things like finite state machines. And I've used it myself in a somewhat interesting manner where the students in a web programming course have to develop websites and all they paste in as their answer is the URL of the website and the template code that I then write throws different um, gets and uh, posts and everything to their website to see if the website's behaving correctly and it grades their website. We have a quiz server to run all this. We've set, set up our own um, Moodle server. And it has uh, currently it has a, an 8 core Moodle front end, it has a dual core database back end, and a sandbox 4 core, what's called Job Engine, Job Server. And it can handle around about 80 program submissions uh, per minute. That's a bit over one a second, up to one and a half really, at sustained rates. We can keep that up more or less forever and we can handle burst of just about anything. And still that's maintaining a response rate of less than about four seconds. So these are the sort of performance figures you need if you're going to run a test with say three or four hundred students if you can get enough uh, computers for them to sit at. And th this, this works for about that sort of load without the students getting caught out by very long delays in, in their testing. So for some years we've been running our um, mid-semester tests for our programming course using um, Moodle questions, some of which are code runners, some of which are not. And we have been using a randomised quiz where every student gets their own personalised, randomised quiz question which contains a selection of 18 questions, from every, two from every lab, two from every drill quiz. We have a set of question um, pools for them to play with called drill quizzes. And there's also some questions that they don't get to see in advance. And this gives them instant feedback and they seem to like that and we don't have to do any marking. But um, we think that's great. And so we've been doing that for some years and it has been very successful. So what's Tim asking? More Moodle servers and more Jared servers. You want more? <laughs> Um, would it run off a USB stick? Um, oh, Tim, I see you, I don't think you um, Yeah, sure, well, yeah, sure. I run it on my laptop, but obviously the, the, the limit somewhat in your load handling. So, the big event is coming up. Oh, this actually doesn't tell you much, it was just a, a random histogram from one of our tests, and it just shows that it's not doing anything weird, really. And what is exciting is that we're thinking of moving to final exams. In fact, not thinking, it's a definite, it's going to happen. We did it for a pilot study of 20 students in the summer school this year, and we we're all turned up to do it with 200 students in our second semester, first year programming paper. Assuming nothing goes wrong, we'll then bite the bullet and try and do it with 450 students next year. This is going to be slightly problematic and I'm not sure if anybody has wisdom here to impart. We're going to need at least two sittings, I think. I'm not quite going to go with that 450 students sprayed all over the campus in different labs. It's too much of an issue managing the sittings. I'd rather have most of them in, in large laboratory areas. So I don't know whether we have a randomised test again, because these ones won't be randomised. Um, or whether we try and sit the, uh, get them to sit the same test back to back or what. Bring your own device e-exam systems. <laughs> I see that there. Yes, um, there's nothing to stop the student bringing their own device. Um, we don't want that for the randomised test which is sampling from the existing labs for reasons I can explain if you're interested, but it would work for a final exam if the questions were really new. But I'd just like to mention one thing that was quite amusing. I had an Indian colleague send me an email to ask for a bit of assistance installing Code Runner a few months back. 
And I suggested that he'd be better off using the development version. He said, I'll worry about that after the exams, which I didn't think much about that. And then two weeks later, a whole two weeks later, he sent me an email to say, great excitement, by the end of today, we will have run 750 students through the final exam, which was somewhat amazing to me because I've been working on this for four or five years and I'm building up with a lot of nervous tension to running 200 students. And here was he straight off in two weeks' time from where to go running for 750 students. So full marks to him for courage. <laughs> I haven't got that much. So, so more or less to summarise here, um, the student benefits, they do find it highly motivating. I don't have any ways of measuring this. I'm not sure I would believe them if I did, but uh, I certainly get that impression and they tend to complain in other papers, why don't you do it that way, you know, that they've been exposed to this, this model of program learning. It gives them all their usual development environment, so it's a very natural, familiar environment for them. And it's marking authentically, that is, we're testing whether they are really doing, it's really behaving the way uh, the spec sees. And of course it's consistent. And they get instant feedback, which they really, really appreciate. And also, it's, it's necessary when you're doing a programming exam, that the lack of confidence builds up as you do more and more questions. So this goes away in this sort of exam. They thrash a little bit on one question, they submit it, it goes green, and then they can just totally forget about that and move on to the next one. And the teacher benefits then uh, motivated students. And I'd just like to tell one story about the motivated students, which I think um, it's purely an anecdotal story, but it captures my sentiment rather nicely. I was in the lab a few months back and the students were doing an assignment and it was due in that day, and a couple of them called me over. Two girls sitting side by side, can you have a look at our programs before we submit them? And I said, no, sorry, that's not the idea at all. You have to take responsibility for your programs. But do remember, you know, it's only 5% for this assignment, and it's only going to cost you 0.5%. Oh, oh, I don't know. Oh, 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 they said, so then they said, come on, let's do it. And they, they held hands, and they counted one, two, three, check. And there was a sort of tense two or three seconds and both screens went green and they leapt to their feet with a whoop of joy and high-fived each other. And that gave me, I think, even more buzz than it gave you. So it really is quite a joy to teach with this tool. Of course, it's efficient. So, um, well, it's efficient over a period of years at least. So we've used the same, essentially exactly the same mid-semester test in twice a year in the first and second semester courses for some years now. It just samples from the existing pool of questions. And it's authentic. And so more or less to finish off with, I'll just I'll throw up a slide and then while you can look through this, I'm going to look through the chat questions to see what I need to deal with. But the key thing that comes up is how much they enjoy the instant feedback. And I should mention these quotes were not in answer to a question, what did you think of Code Runner? They were, what did you think of the course? In fact, what, what were the best things about the course as a whole, not about the quizzes or the labs or the lectures or anything like that? And so those are some responses. So let me see, what are my questions? Bring your own device for the exams. Yes, well, there's no reason why they can't bring their own device uh, if the exam questions are not the same as the ones they did in the during the year. We used to let them have a completely open, uncontrolled, un, un, um, restricted environment to do their programming in. But over a couple of years, what we discovered was that they built up a uh, online cheat sheets where they could just type in one or two words and pull in the answer from the labs and just paste it straight in without any programming at all. So uh, if you're going to let them see programs they've seen before, you can't go uh, open. So bringing your own device has problems. We get them to sit in a restricted virtual machine that is um, firewall, so they can't get out to the servers, can't see their own file system, anything like that. They have all the normal programming tools, but no internet access except, of course, to code runner. And now what are we seeing here? One USB per student. Well, in large exams, I guess I'm not sure that we have a problem. I think we can we can accommodate. We'll probably run 400 students per um, 
think really anyone sitting on a single server with, with eight core front end. We could we could run a, a double one of those, I think. And, uh, so I think the major limitation isn't the CPU power. Um, it's it's more a matter of controlling the situation well enough. This is a stored on a little DB. Um, Share this personal plug transforming exams dot com. <laughs> I'll have to um, read that one obviously. Um, results of these larger exams. So this is uh, asking about the final exams of 400 students or 200. I'm, I'm keen to see them as well, so I share that with you. Whoever, who am I speaking to, Matthew? Yes, I certainly would like to see how the, um, how the 200 student exam goes. We got a very positive response from the 20, and I think it will scale up to the point where the server ran out of grunt. What about students who are studying at a distance? Um, good question, Deb. We can accommodate them. We do that a little bit. We normally have some students who are high school students sitting in. They have to be in an invigilated environment. So we do allow them to get a school teacher to sit in and watch them to make sure that they're doing it themselves. But you do need to have some invigilation, some control. You have to prevent the form of cheating I was talking about where they essentially just build a database of all the questions they might get asked. Probably give it to the mate who doesn't do any programming at all. Does it need installation of extra service for processing? Um, yes and no, Andrew. The, the system has the capability of running programs in different ways, what, what are called the sandboxes. So the current distribution, I, the only sandbox I enable is a remote sandbox, so it's separate from the main Moodle server. And that could be installed on the in the university Moodle server, but the need for the extra server to run the students' jobs in a safe environment. Now there is a built-in sandbox with the code runner, and the easiest way to get it installed is to just use the built-in server, but I would be very um, nervous if anybody started doing that on the institutional server. It's a pretty good sandbox, we've never had any security breaks, but it's fundamentally a really bad idea to run student code on the same server that has all their uh, marks on it in the database access and everything else, as Tim has just said. Uh, so uh, yes, we do. We did run for many years on our own quiz server. We ran them on the same quiz server, but it wasn't the Moodle institution server. And so that's a, a very key distinction. Also, I wouldn't trust the sandbox if I was given access to the outside world. We have a lot of control if it's students on campus and they have to log in through the LDAP server authenticating themselves on the university server first, then we have some control that we can um, check back to see who is trying to crack the system. And that's a fairly strong disincentive to anybody to hack. But if it was open to the outside world, I wouldn't want them to try busting security on the built-in sandbox. So any other questions, folks? That's what I'm seeing here. It's scalable beyond those numbers. So um, yes, I guess as Tim says, yes, just put more servers in. Uh, Tim would know better than me what the limit is. In fact, the limit isn't on the execution that time at all. Most of the uh, cost of running this is, is in Moodle's um, database and uh, all the PHP code that's forming and building the response pages. The actual runs are normally a very quick fraction of a second. And so they don't bog you down at all. Right, bye, Sally. Um, I've got to go soon. I suspect as well. How are people going here? I'm, I'm done. And um, just over to Matthew. Do you want to uh, call for any other questions? Yep, thanks, Richard. That's been great. Um, very interesting. Um, as I was sort of saying through the text chat, I'm interested in your application. Um, we're developing here. Um, an e-exam system that basically is a live Ubuntu USB stick that has you know Moodle installed on it already. So if we could perhaps stick uh, your your question type in there with its sandbox, um, basically each student will bring their own laptop to the exam, 
and they boot the laptop with the USB stick, then of course the USB stick controls the software environment. Um, so essentially what we're trying to do in this case is uh, at the moment uh, restrict the students from having internet access at all, so we disabled all the network drivers and what have you, and the student does the whole exam on the USB stick environment, saves the responses to the USB stick, and then gives us back the USB sticks. Um, so I was thinking if you could have this uh, programming uh, interface, this question type uh, system in, inside each USB stick, then it's essentially one, one Moodle server per student. Um, so, and then that way the idea is that we can scale uh, almost infinite, infinitely um, with the number of USB sticks. So, yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yes, I haven't thought of it that way. You're right. Um, I can't see any reason why you couldn't do that. The USB stick might be getting a little bit large-ish if it was a MATLAB exam, but if it's something like Python, um, you'd have to install Python and a very simple Python IDE, and uh, the Essential cost of the data, the extra cost of running code runners is tiny then. You just need to make sure they have the programming environment as well, of course. Yeah, sure. You could stick an SDK on there, I suppose. At the moment, it's all open source components, so as long as we stick with that, then we shouldn't have any licensing problems. Um, so that's what I was sort of asking if you thought this would be able to run off a live USB stick environment, and uh, it's certainly something we should uh, investigate in the, in the future. <laughs> Yeah, no, really interesting idea. Thank you. Mm. No, happy to collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you said you were coming over. Are you coming to Christchurch? Um, I'm going to Dunedin. Um, so I'm oh, going wrong, to be wrong, at the Ascalite, the Ascalite <laughs> conference. <laughs> Do you know Ascalite? No, sorry. Yeah, okay. Ascalite is the Australasian Society of um, Computers and Tertiary Education. So it's normally held in Australia, but this year it's held in New Zealand. So. Uh, but certainly I could um, perhaps pop up to visit you <laughs> uh, well, if you yeah. remember, so that might be a good idea. Um, whilst people are still hanging around the room, if you could please uh, fill in the uh, feedback survey. The link on the slide is actually clickable, so if you click that, um, you could go to the feedback survey. Um, Tim, yes, um, the idea of um, using things like stack and math, mathematic uh, formulas and uh, algebra uh, editors and things is certainly something we would like to look into as well. Um, at the moment, sort of our, the, the what's kind of holding up the e-exam progress at the moment is things like you know being able to do algebra, uh, being able to do things like computer programming, and another area we want to look at is how to do um, diagrams. That is, is an easy way for the students to draw into the draw draw responses. Um, the exam system already has the GIMP software in it. But if you've ever tried to draw on a touchpad or using a mouse, you know how <laughs> hideous that can be. So uh, we're still just, uh, thinking about different ways to add in uh, easy to do drawing capabilities. So yeah, uh, Tim, we probably should talk more <laughs> at some point. So um, if you want to get along to the, uh, I think I remember, Tim, did you stick your name down for the uh, e-exam conference? I think you did, so yeah. A HTML5 diagram editor, yes, that's probably going to be a good idea. Um, if you want to code one and open source it, great. <laughs> yeah. Sure, will do. Um, okay, so anybody else got questions or comments before we head off? I know you see James and Neil are typing. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, James. That's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Yep. So we'll release the uh, recording reasonably soon. Um, probably I'll go home and t tonight and do the recording and the editing and upload it, hopefully, um, because I've got to get ready for the e-assessment conference next week as well. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, formally, thank you, Richard. It was very interesting and definitely a lot of food for thought there. Um, and I think it's got some people's um, minds uh, ticking over. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew.